I'm going to show you some stories in the Bible. All right. So let's go ahead and go to Acts 1.13. Uh, this is number one, stories of movement phases. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of the names was about 120 and said, and then they, they're speaking about the upper room right there. So before the Holy Spirit came, he gave them a battle plan of what they were going to be doing. And he said, wait for me um, in Jerusalem until I give you power from on high. And then he declares to them, and when the Holy Spirit comes to you, then you will be a witness from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The reason why it's important, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, we have to realize there's a spiritual principle of Jerusalem is where they were, right? And then Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, they were farther from where they were. But what we have to understand is that that is also a prophetic signal. That's not just locally. So that's not just me saying, my Judea, my Jerusalem is in America, and then it's to Canada, then it's to Latin America, then it's to the ends of the earth. What it actually was saying in the book of Acts was that the gospel, if you read the book of Acts, started in Jerusalem, and then it went to Judea. And then it went into Samaria. Then it went into the ends of the earth. And so the ends of the earth is where we are right now. That's the 40% of the world that hasn't heard the gospel yet. So it's prophesied that the Holy Spirit will go to the ends of the earth, which is the unreached. So it's important to know that because he's not just talking about our locality. There's a principle there, but he's actually talking about the 1040 window. He's actually saying once it progresses out of Jerusalem, it will then go to every single people group that doesn't have Jesus Christ. And so 2,000 years later, there's still 40% of the planet that doesn't have that. And so it's important to understand that there is actually the rest of the story that we have to watch out. And so they used that blueprint. So when the Holy Spirit came, they knew what they were supposed to be doing. That's preparation. And so when people ask me, um, are we going to go to other countries? Are we going to go to other places? My answer is normally, well, because it always is, is that the Lord's given us a blueprint. He's given us a critical path. And he's saying that from Taguig, I'll open up the rest of the country and you'll see school divisions train missionaries that will be sent to the ends of the earth. And he's saying the work in Taguig isn't done until they've sent their first missionary to the ends of the earth. So we're not done till that happens. You can't shortcut the blueprint. Just because 127,000 people got saved doesn't mean we're done. What we need to see is 127,000 people in the 1040 window. That's what we're looking for. Every, there's 10% of every Filipino moves overseas. 10% of them go to the Middle East. So that means one hundredth of every Filipino will probably be working in the Middle East sometime. Which how many of you know any Filipinos that work in the Middle East? Anybody? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You don't know anyone that works in the Philippines? Go ahead, raise your hand if you know anyone that works in the Middle East. Right? So that's already, if I were to ask, you guys don't know anyone that works in the Middle East? You don't have anyone? Pastor Rami, you know him? Uh, yeah, Pastor Rami of uh, Vierta, yeah. Yeah, he has a family member working there. Yeah, see, you do know, see? You think I don't know this stuff? You think I just, you think I just, where you think I came from? All right, so anyways. Okay, so anyways. Um, the idea there is that you're, here's, here's something too. You're not just trying to gunshot a nation. You're trying to change the trajectory of the future of a country. That's what you're aiming to do in global missions. You're not trying to gunshot a report. You're trying to change the direction an entire country will go in 50 years. That's why you have to change the sphere. That's why you have to change the culture. That's what you're looking at when you're changing a movement, when you're having a movement of transformation hit a country. All right, let's move to the next one. Uh, proclamation. 
Acts 2, uh, 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day there were about 3,000 souls that were added to them. This is in Rome. This is where people are getting killed and all this other stuff. And right after Jesus got crucified, he preached the gospel. This is a quote unquote persecuted nation. That's where he's doing this. And then they get baptized in public. Here's a misconception of the gospel. What we normally think about is whenever you preach the gospel, there needs to be a one for one ratio of shepherds of the shepherds to those that get evangelized. That's sometimes what people think. That's not biblical. There's no biblical substance of anything that's ever happened in the Bible where there was a follow up system for one for one. Never happened. Doesn't exist. Most people that want that never evangelized. And then they use that as an excuse to not evangelize. Because they say, unless there's a one for one ratio, I don't want to preach because I don't want an abortion. When I got saved, I didn't have a church for like three years. But what if no one preached the gospel to me? Then what? Because I didn't have a one for one. I wouldn't be here. So anyways, they all got discipled. I'm going to get into that. But I'm not saying don't disciple, but I'm saying this would happen. The beginning ratio was 3,000 lost to 120 saved. That's how many people were saved. That's how many people were lost and baptized. So let's go further. Nearly 30 to 1. So that means for every one person, there was 30 new conversions. It's nowhere near what we think is what we can handle. And so you let the momentum create the chaos. When God is bringing a revival, you don't try and control it. If 3,000 people want to hear the gospel, then 3,000 people are going to hear the gospel. If 10,000 people want to get saved, 10,000 people are going to get saved. You don't restrict how many people can get into heaven based on how many people you can follow up. That's completely unbiblical. Because Jesus, he, if he was waiting for the church to have a one-for-one -one ratio, he would have never started the church. Because there was 12 people. And then Jesus went out to thousands, thousands of them. Let's go ahead and move a little bit further. Multiplication. Now, just for the record, all of these guys get discipled because they stuck in the place. So I'm not saying evangelize and don't stick around, but I'm saying don't limit the evangelism based on how many church members you have. You have if you're going to preach the gospel, preach it, but make sure you have a follow-up plan. So I'm, I'm, that's actually the next part of this thing. All right, the next one is this. The, the proclamation and demonstration go together. The next one is the apostles, um, let's go to Acts 6, 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. See, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. They multiplied in Jerusalem, and a great many of priests were obedient to the faith. So even the religious leaders of the Jewish sect, they started getting saved. So all of the, all of these people, they got saved and then the word spread and then they multiplied. If you know you won't have a movement if the, if the momentum isn't being talked about. So I can tell real quick if I'm going into a region and someone's trying to start something. And then if I look at who's starting it and I look at their people and nobody's talking about it, I know it will not multiply. It's very hard to create momentum, but it's incredibly easy to kill it. You have to stay on the pony. You have to stay on the, on the horse. You have to stick on the stallion. You can't leave it when it gets too fast. There is a lot of times, even with this campaign right now, where it's like the natural thing would be to slow it down. You're like, we got to slow this thing down. There's like, there's so many people, we can't even figure out how to do this thing now. But you can't slow it down. Right now we have um, eight public schools that we're working with, something around that time. That's around 20,000 students. By the end of the year, we're looking at 10 to 20. That will look at something like 60 to 80,000 students that we'll be working with, or 60 to 80,000 people in general. But if that's the Lord's plan, guess who changes? We do. If we don't know how to handle 80,000 people, guess who learns it? 
We do. Does anyone know how to disciple 80,000 people? Well, we got to figure that out. That's what that means. And so when we get the open door with a school and the faculty telling us, oh, can you train all of our faculty on how to do Bible studies? That's an open door. That's like, a oh, that's what we were praying for. So you have to look for those things. But unless you're thinking outside of the box, you'll never see those things. There's a very, there's a very demonic demon that you have to watch out for. And he's dressed very nicely. Dressed really nicely, looks very clean cut. He's very, smells good, like a nice cologne. And uh, he speaks really well. And when he talks, it's very articulate and it's very nice and it looks like it's very all together. But you know what else it is? It's religiosity. And the second you try to box Jesus, you crucify him. Who crucified Jesus were the Jews. In fact, he looked at the Jews and said, this is the guy that's saying he's your king. Do you want me to kill a murderer or do you want me to kill him? And all the Jewish leaders said, kill him. It was a very clean cut, nice, prepared, that killed him. Religiosity kills Jesus. Not religion, which is the relationship with Jesus. Religiosity. It's the, it's the fakeness. It's the Pharisaic spirit that says that you know how God should run, so let's keep him in that box. When we box God, we crucify him. When you try and control a movement, you kill it. And you don't want to stop movement. That was the first lesson that Mark taught me. He sat me down, he looked at me, and I was drinking all this coffee, like, because I'm trying to keep up with his brain. And then he looked at me and he said, all right, here's the first thing that's gonna happen. When you get growth, an explosion comes of power and harvest. And then you get chaos. And then when you get chaos, you have to organize it. What people do, and the biggest thing that most of the people I train do, is that they'll try and contain the chaos and kill it and manage it. And then he told me, you cannot try and smallen or lessen the chaos so that you can manage it. You have to sacrifice your life and grow into it so that you could push it forward. And then he told me that almost two or three times. He almost repeated it. And I was really trying to think about that. And I was like, and now I know what he was saying. Because now we got this movement that's almost uncontrollable. The second all of these schools get a handle of what we're doing, this thing's going to blow over everywhere. And all of these schools are going to want YWAM hubs. All of these high schools are going to want biblical training. All these, y, all these schools are going to wonder, well, why did that school get so much fruit? How can you do it to us? And then so you're thinking of millions of people that are going to ultimately want access to this thing. Your goal isn't to try and contain it. Your goal is to say, well, how do you get it to a million people? That's what you're aiming for. There is 110 million people in the Philippines. How do you let 25 million of them access it? You have to think by discipling the percentage of the population. So anyways, we'll get into that tomorrow. All right, so let's go ahead and move forward. The next one is mobilization, Acts 19, 21. After all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem. And he went through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been in Jerusalem, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent Timothy and Aristus, two of his helpers, to Macedonia. But he stayed a little longer in Asia Minor. You see, now he's at the fifth phase. He went all the way from preparation. He proclaimed the gospel, the apostles. The apostles multiplied. They saw a transformation in all of the area. And then they started mobilizing and sending leaders to new regions. That's the blueprint of what you're looking for. You have to watch if this is happening. The critical path of every single region we're at isn't done until it succeeds in this. By the masses. You're not looking for five people to do this. You're looking for 5,000 to do this. There's a big difference. One time, Mark, he's the one that challenges me, right? I was talking to Mark and I said, yeah, we're expecting everything to grow and double and then it should double, and then it should get bigger and bigger. And then he said, no, 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 you're thinking wrong. You need 10,000 now. 10,000 missionaries now, that's what you need. 
You don't need like a 2% increase. You don't need like a little bit of this. You need 10,000 missionaries on the field right now. And I said, but that would be a lot of DTSs. You see, it's trying to box it, right? You can't think like that. I looked at, I looked at it and I was like, the only way you can get 10,000 missionaries on the field now is if you send them from a bigger school. If you send them through the public school, you might get that. But if you send them through DTSs, well, you can get that. YWAM is, is estimated to be at a quarter million in 10 years, in actually five to six years, actually. So that it's by multiplication, that will happen. But if you want it hastily, if you want it now, you need a bigger target. You need a bigger, you need a bigger platform. And you won't get that with a school of 14. But you 14 might be the ones that train to 10,000. You get that? Even all of the arts and entertainment that we're doing now, the public school is asking us, can you give us that material? All of the public schools are, the public schools are working with now, they're saying, well, what do you teach in YWAM? Can you just teach us? So you start seeing it, right? It's a long-term process, but you have to, if you never think with the new wine skin, you'll never be able to hold the new wine. You can't put the new vision into the old framework. If God is doing a new thing in the generation, you can't do it with the old system. You have to ask him, what does this mean now? How do you do this now? What is it right now? That's what you're asking God. That's what you're sacrificing your life to see happen.